We're so excited to move forward for our future because we believe that God has an incredible future for us. In fact, I want to pause this mo- for a moment because this is Memorial Day weekend. And for those of you who currently serve in our armed forces or have served in our armed forces, would you let us honor you? By, by, would you please stand and let us recognize you here this morning? Come on, stand up. We are so grateful because during Memorial Day, we remember the sacrifice that was made in order for us to enjoy the freedom that we have in this country. May we never take that freedom for granted. And may we always seek to maintain that freedom for ourselves and for the sake of others so that they can live the life that God intends for us to live, and speaking of our freedom and, and speaking of our future in general, and by, we're, we're excited about our future, but have you noticed how people have been talking about the future lately? Have you noticed the news? Have you noticed the feeds? Have you noticed the articles? Have you noticed all those things that are going around these days? It's crazy, isn't it? It's so negative. It's so doom and gloom, and it's like everything's about to go under, right? Have you noticed that? In fact, what I find interesting is that even among quote, unquote, Christian circles, there's a lot of negativity about that as if like, well, you know, one day when we get to heaven, everything's going to be great. But in the meantime, man, it's going to go downhill from here on out. And there's this whole bunch of negativity right now. And the problem is, is that if we're not careful, we're tempted to slip into that. We're tempted to fall into this. We're tempted to adopt the same negative mentality and a negative perspective for our lives, except for the fact that God said something contrary. God said in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, he said, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope. And a future. Did you catch that? A hope and a future. That is a positive outlook for the days to come. And despite all that has happened in our world, God knew it would happen. He already saw that from the beginning. And God wants us to know that he still has something planned for us, for you today and for the future. In fact, there's a hope for your future. There's a future worth living There's a future worth pursuing. And there's a future you don't want to miss. See, when it comes to God's will for our lives, when it comes to God's plan for our lives, there are at least two things we need to keep in mind, two fundamental things. Number one, God's hope and plan for our lives is always good. This passage is one of many that underscores that key reality. And here's the one of the key things to remember when it comes to God's plan for our lives. While God has a good plan for us, that doesn't make ensure that we will experience it. In other words, just because he has a good plan doesn't mean that it's going to be automatic. Why? Because we have a choice in the matter. We can choose that future or not. We can prepare for that future or not. See, we could embrace that future Or we can miss that future. And I don't want us to miss out on that future. And those of you joining online, I'm so glad you're here. And I don't want you to miss out on that future for your life. Here's the deal. God has for us in this seemingly upside-down world that we now live in. Because I get it. Your your plans have been turned upside down. Your hopes have been turned upside down. I get that. But in spite of all this, God is still in control. God still knows what's going on. And God still can navigate your lives to the future that is hopeful, that is good. So what we're going to learn today is that we're going to step into this future. How do we do that? How do we ensure that we don't miss out on it? Because I don't want you to miss the future that God has for you. I don't want to miss that future either for my life. So how do we prepare for our future? How do you prepare for your future? There's a passage in Scripture in the Old Testament that we're going to look into today to answer that question. 
It's found in Exodus chapter 17, beginning with verse 8. And we're going to read verses 8 through 16. And what we're going to do is just before, as you're looking, opening up your Bible app or opening your Bible to that passage, let me give you a quick context of the passage. And the context is this. It's a time of Moses. And Moses has been called by God to deliver his people, the Israelites, out of slavery from the nation of Egypt. Now, Moses did that. God performed incredible miracles. And God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. They have already passed through the walk through on dry ground when God parted, divided the Red Sea. They've already done that. And they were currently in, the, in progress. They were currently en route to what the future that God had for the Israelites. The future was the promised land. They were on the way. And as they were going on the way, it was in this context that we read right now. You tracking with me? So all this happened on the way to the future God intended for them. And in this context, we're going to learn what we need to do on the way for the future that God has for us. So Exodus chapter 17, beginning verse 8. In fact, let's all stand as we honor reading of God's word together, okay? Just, I'm going to read out loud. Just follow along with me. It says, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites. So Moses had ordered at Moses, uh, excuse me, so Amalekites, as Moses had ordered, and Moses, I'm in a hurry, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron Hur held his hands up, up one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on the scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out, blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. And he said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. That's our passage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. We're grateful that you're the God who gives us a hope and a future. And we don't want to miss it. Show us how we can step into it. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Now, how do we prepare for the future that God has for us? Okay, the lesson, the first lesson is found in verse 8. The first eight. Let's go back to it. It says this. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Now, there are a couple of things we need to notice here. First, notice that this attack happened before they entered the promised land, right? They were on their way to the promised land when they were attacked. And what makes this notable is because what we learn about the promised land is that the promised land was when the big battles were going to happen. Yeah, you heard me right. The promised land is where the big battles are going to happen. So in other words, this was the fight before the fight. You know, a lot of times when we, we think about God's plan and God's future and, and God's promised land, quote, unquote, for our lives, we think of that season and that period of time as a conflict-free, comfortable, easy kind of thing. Because after all, it's the promised land. See, we want this great life, right? See, so many of you, and, and I'm the same way, isn't it true that all of us ache for significance? All of us want to live a life of accomplishment. Isn't that true? All of us want to live a life that's described as victorious. But here's the deal. We sometimes overlook the fact that there's no significance without struggle. There's no accomplishment apart from adversity. There's no victory 
without battle. And so you wonder, well, wait, 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 the promised land? Isn't the promised land supposed to be easy? No, no, no. The promised land is the place where we become all God calls us to be. See, God calls us to the promised land not to be to avoid battles, but in the context of battles that we become like his son Jesus. You see, so it is like it was for the Israelites, so it is, uh, so it is with us. See, that life of honor, that life of dignity, the life of nobility, by the way, all three are summed up in Jesus. When Christ calls us to follow him, it's to follow in the path of nobility, in the path of honor, in the path of dignity. When we follow that life, we need to realize that life is birthed and is painted on the canvas of conflict. And so if you're trying to picture a life without conflict this side of heaven, it's not in the view of reality. Don't look at it that way because it's false. So, again, what we're learning is, is this is the fight before the big fight. There's a second thing that we want to notice here. This attack happened at a particular location. And the location was called Rephidim. Now, the name Rephidim means rests. In other words, this was this watery kind of an oasis type situation in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of the desert, right? And I find it, so, so it's kind of like a rest stop. You guys know what a rest stop is, right? How many of you have been a long road trip? And you're like, I'm just dying to make it to the next rest stop. And you're like, oh, okay. And I'm sure the Israelites felt the same way. They were on the way to the promised land. They just came out of Egypt, away from slavery, and went through, and went through the Red Sea, incredible journey. And they've been trudging through the desert. And they came to Rephidim, and they were at a point of rest. And get this. It was at the point of rest that they encountered resistance. It was at the point of rest that they encountered resistance. And that's kind of a big deal. By the way, do any of you feel attacked lately? Have you ever felt attacked? You know what I'm talking about? The thing about being attacked, the thing about encountering attacks is that normally we don't choose the attack. The attack chooses us, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, think about it. Nobody signed up for COVID-19. How many of you were like, oh, give me that virus? No one did. See, the virus chose us. We're in it. And now we have to deal with it. See, for some of you, you didn't choose to lose your job. The job chose to lose you. Right? So for some of us, we didn't, all of us really, we didn't choose the economy that we're in. The economy chose us. And I don't get and I don't realize of all the things that you're going through. There are a lot of things people go through and you're going through through your unique circumstance. Though I don't know it, here's what I do know. Most of the time, that conflict, that problem, that pain chose you. You didn't choose it. So why does God allow attacks to come upon us? Here's one of the reasons why. Because there's a tendency along the journey of our lives to stop and to reside when God all along intended for us to simply rest. There's a tendency in you and there's a tendency in me to reside at rest stops and fall short of reaching the promised land. See, what the Israelites could have been tempted to do is this. Hey, we come a long way. After all, we're no longer slaves. That's a big deal. We've been emancipated. We've experienced God's miracles of the plagues in Egypt. We experienced going through the sea and walking on dry land. Can you imagine having that experience? And for a lot of people, we would have been, oh, that's enough, God, that's enough. So we've traveled far. We have already accomplished much. God has already done some amazing things in our lives. We're at Rephidim. Let's just rest here and reside. 
And what, one of the reasons why God allows attacks to choose us is because while God may have allowed us to experience some great things, God never calls us to settle in this life. God does not call you to settle in this life. See, the goal of this life isn't to settle here. The goal is to live for the life to come, guys. See, this life that you and I live on this planet with a life expectancy of what, 80-some-odd years? Is it just to live the 80-some-odd years? No, no, no. It's to find eternity with Jesus. And that is why the purpose for our church, again, you've heard me say this before, and I'll tell you again, and I'll keep telling you, the reason why we exist is for Jesus and for those who don't know Jesus yet. Because it's not about settling here. It's not about just living for this life. It's about living our life for an eternal purpose, for an eternal difference. And therefore, attacks come to us and chooses us to get us off of our complacency, of that, that our tendency to settle. There you go. Out of the mouths of babes. Here we go. See, here it is. You got to understand, up to this point, the nation of Israel, all they knew about their lives was being a slave. They had no idea what it meant to be a nation, right? And now, what is one of the first things you need to do in order for you to become a nation? Well, one of the first things you have to do is to organize an army. You have to know how to defend yourself, right? You have to be prepared for attacks, and you have to have a defense for your people. Well, Israel didn't have that, right? They didn't have that. And they were suddenly attacked, and you better believe in that moment they realized we need an army. And so I don't know how the conversation went. Maybe it went something like that. Hey, how many of you have ever fought before or want to be in a fight? You're drafted. You're in. The army is going to happen, and we're going to fight back against the Amalekites, right? See, here's the deal. In life, the life that we live today, sometimes we just get jumped on. Sometimes we just get attacked. See, and when we get jumped on, guess what? You don't have a choice. You may not want to fight, but you don't have a choice. By the way, have you ever been asked to do something that you're not prepared to do? Yeah, I think, yeah. And here's the way we sometimes respond. And maybe you responded this way during the season that we've been going through these several weeks. Some of you have said inside, or maybe even out loud, I'm just not ready for this battle. I'm not ready for this difficulty. Some of you say, God, I am not ready for this season right now. No, no, no. It's not fair because I just don't need this right now. God, you know what my issues are. You know I've already been discouraged. You know I've already been having problems, and I just don't need this right now. That's the way some of us have been acting, right? Come on, let's be honest. Let's be honest. <laughs> Which reminds me about how I learned how to swim. Let me tell you the details real quickly. I was about 10 years old. And I was living in Hoover, Alabama, and it was at the, the pool at the apartment complex called Brandywine Apartments, okay? And my Uncle Charlie said, hey, you want to learn how to swim? And I said, sure. And he threw me into the middle of the deep end. Now, my trust level with, with my uncle went down. But my swimming level went up exponentially. I learned how to swim, okay? And here's what I'm getting at. Sometimes the best way to learn how to fight is to fight. I'm sure they felt ill-prepared. Why? Because they were, right? And the lesson that we need to learn first when it comes to stepping into our future to prepare for the future that God has for us is to recognize the best way to prepare for the big fight is to fight the battle we're in now. See, we need to recognize, and this is what you need to write down to those of you taking notes. Hey, the battle you're in prepares you for the battles to come. 
You want to know how to step into the future where God intends for you to? Because after all, remember I said the promised land is great. But that doesn't mean that it's not without battles. And therefore, the battle you're in prepares you for the battles to come. In fact, you may be in a battle right now that makes absolutely no sense to you. You're going like, I don't get this. I don't know why. I don't, why is it so rough for me at work? Why do I have this difficult neighbor that, has, that still happened to move in from, from of all the places that so-and-so could live? You know, it could be that a, that a friend that betrayed you. Or you may be having a child that's struggling and you're thinking, wait, 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 wait. I never expected this. I don't get it. Why is this happening? And perhaps you don't see a purpose to this. And we need to recognize that the battle we're in today, God leverages to prepare for us to engage the battle for our future. In fact, it helps us, helps us to battle for the very future. God is sovereign and he leads us into our future. But from a horizontal human perspective, we need to recognize that the battle for our future is at hand. Really. We have given the privilege because of the choices that we can make. We have the, given the privilege to shape the future we want to live. And it's shaped by those who are willing to fight for it. Let me ask you. What future are you currently fighting for? What future are you fighting for right now? The way we fight for that future is to fight well the battle that's going on now. But that's not all. Check out what happens next. Verse 9. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and her, by the way, it's a he. Her is a guy. He just sounds like a she. Anyway. And then went up to the top of the hill. Okay. Now, Joshua, the name just pops out here, right? And it was, this is the first instance that we were introduced to Joshua. In all the scripture. If you were to read from Genesis on, like, hey, hello, Joshua. This is where he shows up. So, like the rest of the Israelites, Joshua wasn't a professional soldier. You know what he was before? He was a professional slave. And so, he didn't have extensive military training, yet he became the field commander of the battle. So Joshua was called out before he was ready, which leads us to the second lesson and how to prepare for your future. The second lesson is this, step up when you're called out. Step up when you're called out. See, there have been times you've been called to do something, right? You've been asked to to volunteer, you've been asked to do, you know, come on, get, get involved, uh, uh, get, get in, lead something, help out with something. Maybe you've done this at church. Maybe you've experienced some of that at church. Come help out in this ministry or, or, help, or get involved in this service or, or lead out in this ministry in some way, right? And here's what we kept on saying. We kept on saying stuff like, but I'm quite not ready. We kept on saying stuff like, but I'm not equipped, I'm not trained. You know what? You know how to get ready? Doing it oftentimes gets you ready. I, I remember. You see, one of the things that really shaped and impacted my life growing up was a sport called football. And now you got to understand, I came from another place, you can tell. And so, like most kids in the South, they're raised with football in mind, right? They are. It's like you play football and you, and, and you play like the 30 pound league and the 40 pound league and the 50 pound, you know what I'm saying? They play peewee football. I didn't know about football. 
I came to the United States when I was nine, and it was about, you know, and I didn't know really, and I didn't get involved in football until seventh grade. And this is the way I stepped into football. I thought, okay, I would like to play a sport. I didn't even know all the rules. I'm telling you, I only knew half the rules of the game. I didn't even know the positions, and I, I just showed up. I just showed up. And I remember the coach saying, hey, boy, don't you want to run the ball? And of course, I pretended like I knew what was going on. Of course I do. So, so, so my first position was, it was, as a, it was as a running back. And the Orient Express was born. And I discovered, oh, I like this game. I like hitting other people. Legally. I loved it. And I, and I quickly learned doing it. But I didn't just learn the game. I learned about me. And the game wasn't something that I participated in. The game actually shaped me and matured me and taught me disciplines that I needed to grow up to become the man that I needed to be along the way. God leveraged that for me. And in a similar way, here's the deal. You're never going to discover all that God created you to be until you step into and step up to what you're called out for. See, when you're called out, step up. Because in the process is that you discover that God has put something in you that you never knew that he did. See, without a new demand in life, there is no new growth. That is an axiom. That is a reality. Okay? There has to be new demand in life for the new growth to occur. That's part and parcel of that. And weight training is called the overload principle. Right? And notice the kind of job that Joshua was called out for. It was the hard job. It was a messy job. It was a bloody job. See, Moses said, you fight. I'm going to go up to the hill and pray. Now, if we were Joshua, I wonder if we would have responded, hey, how about you fight and we pray? I pray. Right? <laughs> the way God often prepares us for our future involves stepping up and stepping into doing what most people don't want to do. Did you catch that? Because I know that there's a temptation for some of us, and let's admit it, for most of us, is that we end up doing stuff and we say things like, wait a minute, God, how come I always end up getting the short end of the stick? What's up with that? How come that I get the job that nobody wants? How come it seems like everybody else gets to do what they planned? How come everybody else to move forward? How come everyone else gets the opportunities? And I'm dealt with this. Right? And there's a temptation for us to go negative. Realize your situation for what it is. See, God has a great future for us. But he uses the seemingly hard and uncelebrated moments in life to develop us. See, we didn't know Joshua until this happened. He got the hard job. What job are you devoiding because you feel like it's beneath you? What task that you've been called out for that you've been turning down because you feel like it's getting the short end of the stick? What are you currently perhaps resenting because the circumstances of your life messed you up where your plans aren't going the way you thought that it should go? Well, other people, it's, it's, it's happening for them but not for you. And you're like, no, 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 no. Recognize it for what it is. It's preparation for your future. See, Joshua didn't know it at the time, but later it will be 
Joshua who would lead the entire nation into the promised land. In a similar way, check out what Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10 says. Do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. See, the very battle that you don't want to be in, that you are hating to be in, may be the very beginning of the future God has in store for you. Don't despise it. Don't, don't, don't chafe against it. Because the mess you're in is shaping the message that God wants you to be telling in the future. So recognize that the battle you're in prepares you for the battle to come and step up when you're called out, even if it seems small in the eyes of others. There's more. We're going to keep going. Verse 11, it says, as long as Moses held up his hand, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hand, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands were tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands up, hands, hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites army, Amalekite army with the sword. Sorry, I had to read that real quickly. But, I mean, there's just so many things. There are so many lessons. See, that's the way God's word is. is there's so much to learn, even in just a few verses. For example... Let me just give you two quickly, two lessons quickly that's not really pertaining to the lesson, just to give you an example of how powerful God's word is. See, number one, here's a, there's, a, there's a personal growth lesson here. Okay? There's a personal growth For example, you know, it's really difficult to, to, seek, to seek the Lord on our own. Why? Because we all experience a time when we get tired. We all experience a time when we, hey, man, there will be times when our hands are up, like saying, Lord, I'm seeking you, I'm going to you. But you know what? Let's face it. When over the course of life, what happens to our arms? They get tired. And the lesson is this. We will need others to make it through the journey. That's the lesson. God knew that. We always will need the encouragement of others toward the Lord to live the life God calls us to live. See, that's why God commands us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Here's the deal. You know, you notice about our church, we never closed our campus. And it wasn't because we're trying to, to be novel or doing anything like that. Here's what we were doing. We were honoring God's word. Because we know, and he knew more importantly, that we needed each other. There's something important in the gathering. There's something important in the one another. Because we weren't meant to do life by ourselves. That's one facet of it. Oh, there's a there's another, there's a leadership lesson for us to learn here as well. For example, and if you want to be a leader, you first have to learn to hold someone else's arms up before you're able to lift up your arms. See, the question we need to ask is, are, is there anybody, is, is, are you holding up anybody's arms with your life? Whose arms are you holding up? Because the leadership lesson here is that in order for us to be entrusted with authority, you must first be willing to come under authority. I know a lot of people, especially young people, say, I'm ready for this opportunity. I'm gifted, I'm talented now. Hey, I understand. But here's the real deal. You can't be entrusted with the character that you need unless you're willing to come under authority. See, the proper, to have proper authority is birthed from those who have come under authority rightly. See, a whole bunch of lessons, but the lesson that... We, for us in terms of preparing for our future is this. The scripture tells us in verse 9, Moses wasn't just holding up hands, right? What was Moses doing? He held the staff in his hands. So the question we need to ask, what's the significance of the staff? In fact, the staff was called the staff of God. What kind of staff was it? Well, in order for us to understand 
the staff the situation a little bit more, we need to flip back toward a little bit more beginning of the story in Exodus chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. See, it's a situation when God was calling Moses and calling him to be the deliverer of his people. And see, at that point, Moses was in the middle of nowhere, and he was a shepherd. And so the staff that he was having in his hand was a shepherd's staff. And God transformed that staff to become much more significant than a shepherd's staff. See, let me just read the passage. Verse 1, so Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. Then the Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. <laughs> so, the, so Moses reached out and took the hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. There are many reasons for that, but one of the reasons why this staff to snake thing was a big deal is because the Egyptians worshipped the snake god. And when the staff turned to the snake, God was declaring to the, to the gods of Egypt, declaring to everyone that he was the one in ultimate authority over all the false idols, all the false gods, over everything. In fact, Exodus chapter 4, verse 20, there is first called the staff of God. And what we find in this Exodus story is that it was with this, when the staff was stretched out in Moses' hand that many of the plagues came about. It was with God's staff stretched out over the Red Sea that the water parted. Okay? So what the staff symbolized was the authority of God in the presence of his people. And in order for us to prepare for the future that he's calling us into, we need to submit to God's authority in our lives. That's the principle. That's the lesson we need to learn. We need to submit to God's authority, and we need to keep submitting to God's authority in order to step into the future that he has for us. Now, there isn't a staff that we lift today, but we do have the scriptures, the word of God. See, this, just as the staff wasn't just a stick, the Bible isn't just a collection of lessons and stories. It's powerful. It's transformative. It's alive. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And the lesson is, while we may not hold a staff above us, we need to hold the scriptures high and over our lives. In what way is your life under the authority of scripture? If you want to win the battle in life, we've got to submit to his authority. We need to submit to God's word. And how do you submit to God's word? You know what it says. Trust what it says and live it out. Okay? I don't mean to be overly simplistic. I know you get it, but I want us to be reminded of it. How do you submit to God's authority? How do we submit to God's word in our lives? Learn what it says. Trust what it says. And live it out. That's what it means. So you want to win the battle over addiction? You want to win the battle over that issue in your relationship? You want to win the battle over your guilt? You want to win the battle over fear? You want to win the battle over insignificance? Submit your life to God's authority. Know what he says about those things. Trust what he says about those things. And live it out. <laughs> and he says the thing. This, the picture, it's kind of interesting. Because if you were to have, like, if you were a filmmaker, if you were to to direct this, you could have two separate scenes and you can have convey two different messages. For example, if you were to just simply zoom in to what Joshua and the Israelites were doing, you would think the battle was just about the battle. Really? Because if you were to zoom into that scene, it's just a fight, right, between two nations. But if you were to pan out and capture the whole picture, you would recognize it, the battle wasn't about the battle only. 
The issue was the authority of God. And whenever the authority of God was elevated, victory was experienced. Whenever the authority of God was diminished, victory was lost. The same is true with us. See, right now, the battle you're in, the temptation and the tendency is for us to look at the battle as just a battle. Like some of you are in a, in a, in a relationship and you're like, I don't understand why I'm having so much trouble with this. I don't understand why this is, we're having such conflict. Why are the sparks are flying? Could it be that you're violating this, the principles of Scripture and you're not following it? And it's no wonder you're having the issue that you're having? You tracking with me? See, that's what I'm saying. You think it's just the, the just, just you think it's just the argument. You think it's just the fight. No, 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 no. It's not just the fight. It's not just the battle. It's really the issue of are you under the authority of Scripture? Are you following yourself under the authority of the Word of God in your life? Some of you are saying, well, I'm having some financial problem. And you think it's just about the finances. Have you submitted your financial practice under the authority of God's word and what the scriptures has to say about finances? And if you're not coming under the authority of that, it shouldn't surprise any of us if we're having struggles with that. Why? Because the battle's not just the battle. And we like to cry and we like to pout and we like to blame God because of the battle. Why can't you fix it? You don't love us and you don't care. He cares. And he wants to bring us to the future that he has for us. But the fact of the matter plainly is this. We're not ready for it. Because we think the battle is just a battle and we're not growing up. We're not maturing our lives under the authority of God's word. Let me illustrate it this way. As parents, let me see your pa- parents, let me see your hands real quick, okay? How many of your kids, when they were this big, wanted to drive the car? Me drive. Okay, let me ask you this. At that moment, did you hand over the keys to the toddler? Of course not. Because that would be stupid. Is it because you didn't love your child? Of course you love your child. And it's because you love your child you didn't hand over the keys, right? Why? Because the child wasn't ready for it. Wasn't ready for it. See, when they, you have to wait until they grow up older. They mature emotionally, you know, knowledge Showing responsibility, right, before you hand over the keys. We get that with our kids. But sometimes we don't get it in our relationship with the Lord. Because we think, God, how come I'm not in that future right now? How come I have to go through this? What if God's saying, why don't you win this battle here? So you can be ready for what's to come. Because the battle is not the battle. The battle and the question really is about is are we willing to submit ourselves under the authority of God in every aspect of our life? Because here's what we do. We say, God, hey, I give you authority on my Sunday mornings, but don't you dare touch my sex life. I give you authority over, you know, my workplace, but don't you dare let me know. Don't you touch my hobbies. See, so why would God allow us to step into the future when we're not ready for it and we have the potential to destroy the future, the good future he's planned for us because of our lack of maturity. See, the only way God matures us a lot of times is by throwing battles in our lives that we're not asking for and we didn't expect. And it's in that moment, and every time in that moment, we have a choice. 
Will we respond and operate based upon God's word and his authority, or will we simply respond and react and pout and complain or whatever the way we want to? See, what God's trying to do is mature us so we can be the people we need to be to engage the battle of the promised land. But I got to go. Keep going. All right. God has a plan, but let's go to verse 14. The, the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. And you know what? History tells us that is exactly as God said. We know that to be true. Because Israel was indeed at war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. After generation, after generation, until David's generation, because David wiped them out. Now, why did I mention that? Why was that important for me to mention? Because what happens in the Old Testament points to the bigger realities that we discover in the New Testament. See, the significance of David wiping out the Amalekites is because Jesus, who is the ultimate king, the king of kings, not David, King David, the king of kings, he wiped out the ultimate enemy in our lives. See, the ultimate enemy isn't some thing like Amalekites. No, 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 no. The ultimate enemy is the problem of sin. The ultimate enemy is death. And all the things, those things entrap us. And Jesus and going to the cross won for us the ultimate victory. And what we need to recognize is that when these things happen, it points to the ultimate truth of the New Testament. Anyway, the point is, Jesus is the one who truly sets us free and gives us the victory that we need in our lives. Now, notice in verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Why does God tell Moses that? In fact, what we discover is that this is the first time God tells anybody to write down anything. This is the first time. This is the first time in the Bible that God told someone to record what happened. Why is that important to know? Because we need to make important notice that God didn't ask Moses to write down all the times that the Israelites messed up. God didn't say, you know, the last time you messed up, Israel, which was a few verses before our verse, by the way. Just verses before. And the implication is this. God doesn't want to preserve our failures. God is not asking us to hold on to every single failure of our lives. See, he's not gotten us, because even though we may think that, but God doesn't look at you and go, hey, remember the time when you were young and remember you had that memorial day weekend and you went off and you did that something stupid? Yeah, remember that? You need to keep that recorded. God doesn't say, hey, you know that time that, you know, you messed up financially? You made that time that you blew it in front of the rest of your family? Yeah, remember, keep that in the forefront of your mind. Oh, be sure to record and write down every single detail how you messed up. No, that God's not doing that. You know what? Notice what God tells us to remember. He does not tell us to record our failures. He said, remember the victories I gave you. And that's huge. How do you prepare for your future? We've got to remember and remind ourselves of God's past. You see, our lives are built on right memories or it's destroyed on the wrong memories. It's true. It's true. See, our lives are built on the right memories played over and over again in our heads or it's destroyed by the wrong memories that are played over and over again, that are repeated over. I get that something bad did happen in our life. I get it. And I'm really sorry it happened. I really am. 
And I get it. It was unfair. It was unjust. And maybe justice was never served. The good news is there will come a day where God puts everything to right. You can trust that. But in the meantime, if we keep replaying that bad situation, the bad scene, the bad recording over and over again in, my, in our minds, if we keep talking about it over and over and over again, here's what happens. We are establishing a victim mentality. And if you're a Christ follower, you are a victor, not a victim. And so what we need to recognize is that we may have been a victim once, but let me ask you, why by playing it over and over and over, reminding ourselves over and over again, why do we choose to victimize ourselves like that? Here's what we need to do. Instead, we need to let the love and the grace of God cover what has been done to us, even what we have done to others, and play the victory that Jesus has won for us. His goodness over and over and over and over and over again. That's what we got to do. Whenever I face a battle in ministry, because, you know, like you, I face battles. Whenever there's a battle coming up, you know what Purity always does? She's so good. She said, remember we faced something like this before. Remember what the Lord did for us then? And I go, yeah, babe, you're right. You're right. And I am emboldened to step into the future. See, the future that we're longing to experience requires boldness. And the way God prepares us for that is to Remind us of his victory over and over and over again. And that's why we should never get over the cross of Jesus Christ. We should never get over it because on the cross, everything we've ever done wrong, everything we will ever do wrong in life has been forgiven because by the shed blood of his sinless blood. Guys, do you get what the implication of that is? This does not blow your mind. You never have to worry about shame and guilt again. Because when you're right with Jesus, he has covered our sins forever under his blood. We are clear. We are right. We have victory. That's the reality. And when Jesus defeated death, that means that we can now begin to live a death-defying life. We don't cave. We don't cower. We don't shrink. We say, bring it. Because if God can secure eternity and defeat death, what are we afraid of in the temporal and in the life? If God can secure her eternity, can he not handle today? What is it that you're playing? Constantly remember, constantly remind yourself of the victory that he has given. And submit your life under that reality, under that authority. Guys, for some of you, today you've got to surrender areas of your life that's not Submitted under God's authoritative word. For some of us, the action, the response is that. And in fact, our worship team is going to come up just now. I'm going to lead us in a time, just in song. But there's some of you here today that you don't know Jesus. And today is the day you say, I want to submit my life to Jesus, Period. Today is the day that you experience that forgiveness, that new life, the, the future that God has for you with confidence. And this is how you do it. You simply pray, Jesus, forgive me. I am a sinner. I want to repent of my life and turn to you and make you Lord of my life. 
Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And I'm going to follow after you. In your name I pray. Amen. That's it. It's that simple. As those of you who are following online, just click that response online and say, I've accepted Jesus today. I, need, I want to tell somebody about it. If you're on Facebook Live, contact us. Text us. If you're here today, grab the connection card that is seated, that is on the seat, and fill it out. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Let's all stand at this moment. And as we close, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. As Dave leads us in a time of response, if you made a decision for the Lord, just as the staff was raised high and above Moses' head, shamedly, unapologetically say, I have made a decision for Jesus and I will raise my hand. I raise my hand. So as we sing, be bold. Because the future victory is won by victory that you take.